So I want to talk today about, um, about uh, public housing reform as a response to uh, concentrated urban poverty in the United States. Uh, and I'm going to focus my uh, talk on Chicago, which is the largest example of public housing reform uh, in the U.S. But it's um, both the ideas behind and the parameters of uh, this policy are reflective more broadly of uh, public housing policy in the United States, as well as in a number of places in Western Europe, Canada, and Australia. So this is really uh, emblematic in, in many ways of a, of a significant policy thrust toward rethinking public housing and addressing uh, concentrated urban poverty. So I'm going to try to do um, a few different things. First, very briefly, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the history of public, po uh, of public housing and of public housing reform. And then I'm going to focus in on the Chicago example, uh, talk about the sort of theoretical assumptions behind this effort um, and how it is structured and playing out. And then uh, I'm going to dig into some of the findings of our research. Um, focus particularly on one component uh, of the transformation. It's called the Transformation of Public Housing. But I'll give you an overview of, uh, of um, what we know to date about how things are going. And then finally, we'll have some, I'll have some conclusions and some implications and some opportunity for discussion. And although there'll be, I think, plenty of time for discussion and questions afterward, you know, feel free to interrupt at any point uh, with questions of clarification or issues you'd like more uh, detail on. Uh, it's uh, unusual at Chicago to get through a talk without being interrupted, so I, am, I embrace the uh, I embrace the opportunity. Okay, so I'm gonna my talk is based on a research project that we're just really wrapping up. Uh, it's been a, uh, based on it's a mixed method uh, comparative case study re uh, uh, research, but it's based grounded largely in uh, in depth uh, research uh, in three of the ten major mixed income developments that are replacing public housing in, the, in, in Chicago. And uh, this effort, as I suggested, is, uh, okay, so we're gonna step back a little bit and talk about, um, about public housing uh, history. Um, so initially, public housing um, in the United States, first of all, was pretty late in coming. It came uh, in the wake of the Great Depression, as the first effort of the, of the state to provide uh, uh, housing, uh, housing subsidies for uh, people who were at the time temporarily dislocated from the workforce, um, and the idea here was that uh, public housing was going to be a transitional uh, phase for people who, uh, and, ma and mainly housed the sort of upwardly mobile working poor. So at this point, there were very small scale uh, developments. You can see these um, pictures here. These are built in the in the 40s in Chicago, small scale relatively scattered around the city, uh, uh, not very highly concentrated, and very much transitional housing. Uh, not the kinds of depositories of the poor that they became in the mid-19th century. Um, but then there was massive expansion of public housing, particularly after uh, World War II. There was the great migration of uh, rural uh, agricultural workers, African Americans from the south, moving into cities. Um, to take advantage of, uh, of jobs available in the manufacturing and industrial sector. Um, and then there was a real push at the federal level through urban renewal to uh, rethink and remake uh, inner cities, largely through massive slum clearance and through, in, and, and through the expansion of, uh, of public housing. And it's in this period where public housing gets expanded uh, under urban renewal that we begin to see much larger scale public housing. Uh, an emphasis on high-rise tower blocks, very high-density um, uh, complexes. And the ideas behind this new sort of era of public housing drew in part from a set of design principles um, that were promoted by modernist planners and architects. Uh, Le, Cor Le Corbusier, this is a, a, a um, uh, design that uh, that Le Corbusier designed for a redevelopment in Paris was quite influential in thinking about uh, what the what the city of the future might look like. Right. So these are uh, very clean uh, notions of towers in the sky, connected by transportation, uh, surrounded by parkland, functional differentiation of areas of the city. So residents lived here, and commer commerce was here, and industry was elsewhere. Um, and this kind of uh, uh, new um, 
vision of the of the city of the city informed uh, the, at least the design aspects of uh, public housing as it was uh, expanded in the mid 20th century and initially uh, this um, this new housing was quite successful right there were long lists of um, there are long waiting lists of people trying to get in uh, compared to the tenements from which uh, the poor were moving, as is in the um, picture to, the, to your left. Uh, these were very clean, spacious, bright, airy uh, places to live and very much in demand among those who were, uh, uh, seek who were seeking to be rehoused. But very, very quickly, uh, these uh, projects uh, encountered tremendous decline, right? and a proliferation of social, of social problems. So very, very quickly they began to deteriorate physically. Uh, electricity didn't work. Um, elevators didn't work. Uh, there were uh, infestations of vermin, rats, and roaches. Um, they became uh, the depositories for very, very poor people. So no longer were they housing the sort of upwardly mobile working poor, but increasingly they were housing a population that was significantly welfare dependent. Um, so by 1997, for example, only 15% of households in Chicago public housing had an employed member, right? And the average income in public housing in Chicago was less than half of the poverty line. Um, and in addition to these, you know, sort of concentrated poverty, there were a whole set of associated ills, right? Violence, uh, drug trafficking, substance abuse, gang activity, and significant social and racial isolation of the populations of the so why is this? What, what drove these outcomes? So a sec, set of uh, characteristics, set of uh, factors that uh, led to these circumstances. One um, was discriminatory site selection. So basically all public housing, virtually all large-scale public housing in cities like Chicago, which were uh, already quite racially segregated, were placed in majority African-American communities. And in part this was due to, a, to legislation, to a rule that said that new public housing could not change the racial makeup of the neighborhood in which it was built, right? So at the outset, you've got now high concentrations of poor African-American um, residents moving into poor and isolated, racially segregated communities. Second, you have the, the, the dynamics of high density development. So you had uh, many, many poor people um, packed into these very small areas. Um, you had um, very poor design and construction and maintenance and management of these programs, in part because of uh, federal rules that put a ceiling on the amount you could spend per unit, um, and in part just because of mismanagement and, um, uh, and, and poor uh, maintenance um, going forward. And then importantly, had a changing population. So whereas uh, public housing initially, again, housed, was transitional housing um, for the working poor, uh, it began to be uh, the home for the very poorest of the poor. And in part, this was due to a change in the rules about how rents were set. So initially, rents were set based on um, size of unit. Um, later, they were set based on a, a, a percentage of what you earned. So 30% of your income went to uh, covering your rent. And so people who were working and earning relatively more money could actually get a better deal out in the market. And so what you ended up with was the sort of distillation of a very poor population, an increasingly uh, population, um, uh, you know, a very poor population in these, in these areas. So the policy responses, this ultimately proved to be completely untenable. So there were efforts over the course of the 60s and 70s and 80s that tried in a sort of piecemeal fashion to uh, address some of these problems. So crime uh, reduction responses, more intensive social services, uh, but ultimately uh, the, the Congress um, commissioned uh, a report um, to outline responses to what they talked about as severely distressed public housing. And the, the uh, outcome of that report was largely uh, focused on the need to um, uh, to do away with these uh, these most distressed housings, uh, housing complexes, and to think about two streams of policy reform. Right, one had to do with poverty deconcentration, all of which has to do with poverty deconcentration. Right, this is the this is the booger bear. This is the problem we have to solve. And so one uh, policy stream has to do with um, focuses on dispersal, essentially moving 
public housing residents who are concentrated in these large complexes out into other neighborhoods or out into the suburbs, presumably places that are less poor and less racially segregated. And the second stream of policy activity has to do with development, basically the demolition, clearance, and rebuilding of public housing complexes and replacing them with mixed income uh, developments. Well, I'll talk mostly about this second stream, um, but, uh, the, but the Plan for Transformation in Chicago uh, embraces both of these streams of activity. So it's both about dispersal and about development. And uh, it is the most uh, extensive effort to remake public housing uh, in the US, uh, at least in terms of the, its scale and its size and, the, um, uh, and its cost. It's very much like um, much urban policy. Uh, uh, and embraces the, a kind of neoliberal you know, policy argument here. So it relies very much on public-private partnerships, on thinking about um, the ways in which public policy can harness the market and market actors in order to um, address social problems. And it also included a, a significant change in the role of the public housing authority, which shrank from uh, a high of something like 1,500 uh, staff to, uh, I think, about 250 staff um, uh, today. OK, so both of these orientations, both dispersal and development, and the replacement of public housing by mixed income communities, are uh, predicated on a set of arguments about integration, right? That um, essentially, the problems of concentrated poverty stem in large part from the degree to which residents living in it are isolated from uh, and disconnected from opportunities that are available to others who are better connected to the city. Uh, so the Chicago Housing Authority says the plan for transformation aims to build and strengthen communities by integrating public housing and its leaseholders into the larger social, economic, and physical fabric of, of Chicago. Right, so this is the, this is the central claim and the central uh, effort. And there's a set of sort of theoretical assumptions behind why integration matters, right? One has to do with the extent to which integrating poor people into more diverse, uh, particularly economically diverse communities will provide access to a set of resources and benefits provided by social capital, right? So if part of the problem was that uh, people living in public housing were uh, only had uh, relationships with people who had similar networks as their own, um, so they had, they were, they were, uh, they were, they were um, closed networks and close ties that can provide access to people who could uh, help you out in times of need within their means. They did not have access to the kinds of networks of people who had who had who had totally different sets of relationships, through which information about. Uh, opportunities about jobs, about how to deal with the bureaucracy, about childcare, right, um, could flow. So the idea is that if you bring poor people into contact with working people and more affluent people, they ought to, through this propinquity, this closeness, uh, spatial closeness, um, have access to those relationships and those networks that provide information and opportunity. And second, they would provide uh, the political and market influence that comes with living with more affluent people, right? So the city is more responsive because more affluent people tend to vote more. Uh, uh, commercial, uh, this is true in the United States anyway, um, uh, uh, commercial concerns, businesses are more likely to cite uh, and open new, uh, new ventures in neighborhoods where there is uh, more buying power. And so the idea here is that poor people would benefit, right? From, the, from their integration into these, into these neighborhoods. And there's a second set of assumptions about the ways in which living um, in more diverse communities would have an impact on the sort of uh, the, in, the aspirations, the worldview, the future orientations of the poor. And a lot of this stems from a set of assumptions about um, uh, uh, the, the nature of persistent urban poverty and the idea of the development of a kind of urban underclass, right? And that those who are, uh, in, who are poor over generations adopt a kind of culture of poverty, right? A set of, pa a pattern of beliefs and behaviors that are uh, in response to the, their um, 
their, their life in poverty, and in opposition to a set of assumptions about, quote, mainstream values, about work and self-sufficiency. Right? This is a very controversial and, I, I would argue, uh, unfounded um, set of assumptions, but still um, very much um, drives and is very much alive in lies behind this, this, this uh, set of um, uh, policies. So one uh, aspect of this is the idea of role models that, in part, because, they're, because uh, people living in concentrated poverty are, have been isolated from people who go to work every day by observing and being connected to and talking with and learning about um, the, the work of the, 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 these lives, these middle class role models, these middle class people would provide role models, right? And open up new horizons for the poor. And second, they would provide greater levels of social control because homeowners or affluent people are more likely to insist on and be vigilant about adherence to community norms. And then finally, there's a set of assumptions about the ways in which design has an impact on, uh, on the social, right? So the built environment can actually shape and promote particular kinds of community interaction. And the, where, whereas the uh, last phase of public housing expansion in the mid 20th century um, was driven in part by a set of uh, um, design principles that were um, promoted by modernism, the current phase uh, is drawing on ideas about the traditional neighborhood and new urbanism. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. All right, so how is this playing out, right? Um, essentially, in Chicago, most of the demolition, the demolition is complete. So all of the uh, high-rise, large-scale public housing complexes are essentially gone. Much of the planned, new, and renovated public housing is complete as well, although the mixed income development um, construction lags significantly behind, in large part because of the housing crisis and the economic downturn in 2008. And there have been some, we'll talk more about this, but just to give you a little preview, there's been some clear benefits, I think. Um, poor people have moved from projects into less poor neighborhoods, but there's still high poverty neighborhoods. And one could argue, actually, that you know, it would be impossible to find neighborhoods that were more poor right, than the public housing uh, neighborhoods from which they moved. Um, the physical revitalization, where, where mixed income developments are being built, ha is significantly, uh, is a significant improvement on the built environment. There are clear reductions in crime, better housing conditions in these, in these places. But the broader integrationist goals have been quite elusive. So there's continued racial segregation. There have been no, there's no evidence of social capital benefits um, and uh, no real evidence of, or very limited evidence of economic benefits. And there are, uh, importantly, new and rather um, dramatic uh, uh, experiences of e exclusion, uh, particularly in these mixed income communities. So uh, just to talk a little bit about the dispersal component, right? So here's. Um, here's the city, oops, here's the city as it, oops, giving away the next step. Here's the city as it, um, as it looked, it's hard to see, but these light dots basically just here and here, these are public, these are the um, built public housing, large scale public housing, all concentrated, really largely concentrated in the Mid-South, a few on the West Side. These um, black dots here are scattered site housing, which was Where's the, the where is Hyde Park? This is Hyde Park. Um, scattered site housing began to be built in the, in the 70s, uh, in part in response to arguments that uh, public because of the discriminatory site selection, public housing was essentially running afoul of desegregation legislation. And so these um, scattered site houses uh, precede the plan of transformation. Post-transformation, I'm going to move to this side here, you see significant dispersal, right? All of these people who lived here are now all around the south and uh, west sides. And so there's been at least a significant um, out-migration to other neighborhoods. Uh, overlap that map with um, neighborhoods of uh, high concentrations of African Americans. So these red dots, 91 to 100% African American, highly correlated with, with poverty. Right? Most of the people moving out of public housing um, through housing choice vouchers are reconcentrating in highly segregated, still very poor neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. 
And if you look at the census characteristics by housing type, um, you see that there's been, um, you know, uh, across the board, some significant changes in, uh, in the degree of racial segregation, but, but they're still highly segregated. And in fact, housing voucher holders, those dots we just looked at on the map, are living in census tracts that are more completely African American than those who have moved back to renovated public housing. Um, and in terms of uh, poverty, um, you see, uh, you know, uh, you know, reductions. The early public housing, uh, this is traditional public housing, so it's still around 40 percent reductions, but still largely poor, uh, high, high poverty neighborhoods compared to the city as a whole. Uh, you see across the board increases in households that have an earning member. So that is, um, uh, that is a benefit with the exception of the voucher holders. So voucher holders, these people, this is the majority of people who are moved out of public um, housing. Um, uh, very little uh, improvement there. And you see, but you do see across the board uh, improvement in earnings, uh, though everyone is still hovering at or about the poverty line. So this green line is the poverty line for a family of four. Um, and it uh, actually probably underestimates uh, the, the story here a little bit for voucher holders who ha tend to have larger families. And probably uh, uh, things look a little bit better for s folks living in scattered sites because they tend to have smaller, smaller households. Okay, so that's the, that's the dispersal story. Uh, what about the mixed income communities? Um, the, the mixed income communities, um, although they have accepted uh, fewer, a smaller percentage of public housing movers um, than, uh, than moved into voucher housing, are, I would argue, a, still a central manifestation of the transformation. First of all, the de demolition of the of these sites that are now mixed income communities is what drove the whole process of, dem of, of uh, relocation. Um, and secondly, the, it's in the mixed income communities that it, you arguably have your best shot at promoting integration. That is the, that is the stated aim of this um, policy, right? So how is it playing out? Again, just a brief preview. Uh, certainly, as you can see, much better uh, built environment. These are clean, safe, um, well-appointed uh, uh, residences. Uh, these are, there's clearly a better economic mix, and to some extent, in some sites, a, clear, a better racial mix in these sites, um, and significant improvements in safety, as we'll see in a moment. But again, limited economic benefits, limited and sometimes problematic uh, social interaction, and these new dynamics of exclusion that we'll talk about in some detail. So why is that the case? Right? In these mixed income developments, you've got uh, an explicit effort to make integration work. Right? You've got um, an intentional mix, Public housing residents have units set aside for them. There's other low-income rental. Um, there's market rent, rate rental. There's home ownership opportunities at the market rate. Um, there have been a set of community building efforts that um, development professionals and property management have engaged in to try to make these communities work and to try to promote the integration of, uh, of public housing residents into these neighborhoods. Um, and there are a set of design choices that try a la uh, new urbanism to facilitate this kind of interaction, right? That ways of thinking about the built environment um, that will uh, that will support and enhance and catalyze positive social interaction. So, just to give you some examples, here's a you know here's a multi-unit dwelling. There's there's um, and here's a set of townhomes. There are no outward indicators of which of these units is a public housing unit and which is for a market rate renter or owner. So from the outside, you cannot tell who lives where. So a way of trying to reduce stigma and, uh, and, and, and promote integration. You also have this um, effort to spatially integrate public housing and other low-income renters into the community alongside more affluent people. So these purple um, dots are uh, market, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, yeah, purple dots are market rate renters, and red dots are subsidized renters. This is just one section of one of our three sites. And you can see that, that renters at all income levels are integrated at the building level. 
So neighbors are neighbors of vastly different incomes are sharing uh, buildings, and homeowners are integrated at the block level, but not at the building level. So there's this effort again to sort of bring people from very different backgrounds together, where they can interact and uh, coexist. But in spite of these efforts, you have limited social interaction, and to the extent there is social interaction, it tends not to be particularly instrumental uh, and is often contentious. And you have unequal participation in the things that people do in their communities. And that participation is quite compartmentalized, right? So the kinds of activities, organizations that um, public housing residents participate in are those that market rate renters and homeowners don't participate in and vice versa. In addition, you have what we'll talk about in uh, a good deal more detail in a moment, uh, the reliance on a set of market mechanisms and logic. So the kind of the private market and the requirements of the private market um, drive a lot of what um, takes place in these sites. Privileged place of uh, private property and fundamentally different orientations to what these communities should be and how they should, um, how they should work. Uh, particularly between developers, homeowners, and higher income renters on the one hand, and low income renters on the other. And this generates a set of tensions that we'll talk about in some. Um, so the, um, so I think there are, I want to talk about three, three different factors that contribute to the nature of and um, limited success of the integrationist aims here. One has to do with these, with a set of orientations that drive decisions about um, the design and also the management of these communities, um, focusing on sort of market norms and, and broken windows assumptions about crime. Uh, and then I want to talk about the mechanisms and strategies that are used to, um, to govern these communities. And then I'll talk about uh, responses and so first, with regard, with regard to these orientations, the first one has to do with um, the, sort of, the sort of primacy of the market here. On the one hand, sort of exchange value orientations, right? So homeowners um, are uh, very concerned about their homes, not only as places to live, though they're that too, but also as investments that are going to provide a return. Um, and you know, particularly in the, in the context of the housing crisis and the economic downturn, um, the concerns about the value of their homes play into a set of uh, tensions and dynamics in the neighborhood. Uh, in one of two ways, right? Either homeowners are um, more and more uh, concerned and feeling trapped in these neighborhoods, and so more inclined to, um, to get angered by things they don't like in them, or they decide they're going to stick around for a while because there's no way to sell their home at a profit, and so they get more engaged in the communities and in trying to make them work. Um, uh, so related to these, the, to, to exchange value orientations are a set of middle class preferences about what urban life should look like, uh, and a set of um, behavioral expectations about neighborhood norms. And these, as one developer put, put it, should be set for the highest common denominator. Right? Um, and this leads to a set of concerns about uh, general incivilities that lead to a set of um, regulatory responses that we'll talk about in a moment. And again, part of what drives this is the sort of enduring significance of this urban underclass narrative. The fact that basically poor people, um, and particularly public housing residents, don't share the same values, the same expectations, uh, and embrace the same behaviors as middle class people. Okay, so a homeowner in West Haven Park, in West Haven Park which is one of the sites, says, I'm a market rate person, right? So you think about your property value. So you may like the kids on the block, and you might think they're cool, and they should be hanging out, but at the same time, you don't want people driving around seeing them hang out, because right? it might give the wrong impression of your property value. And uh, another homeowner says, you don't, have to go on, you don't have this going on in the communities on the north side. He's talking basically about just people on the street, particularly unaccompanied youth on street corners. Right? You don't have it going on in white communities, and I don't think we have to deal with it here. The loitering, the children just hanging out on the block. They don't live here, so why are there 25 of them hanging out here? Why are kids just walking in the middle of the street? This gives you a window into just the, the sort of basic right, um, level of uh, what counts as incivility that is, that is annoying homeowners. 
Um, this is connected to a set of assumptions about, about crime and safety, right, and, the, and a kind of embrace of the broken windows thesis, right, which basically says that, you know, outward signs of disorder and basic incivilities from panhandling to graffiti to broken windows, as the title says, you know, are, provide cues for people who are inclined toward criminality that this is a place where social control is weak and this is a place where we can, you know, misbehave, right? And the idea here is that if you police incivilities, right, if you arrest the guy selling cigarettes, loose cigarettes on the corner, um, if you uh, um, arrest the six kids hanging out on the street playing loud music, you will uh, eventually, you will undermine and eventually be able to prevent more serious, more predatory crime. Okay? There are uh, challenges to this theory, uh, um, uh, suggesting, for example, that really, you know, incivilities and, um, um, and poverty are, you know, that, that they are, there's a, there's a common, right, um, determinant of both of these things and one doesn't easily cause the other. So, uh, so that's what drives a lot of this. And indeed, you know, in any neighborhood, concerns about crime are real, right? Um, particularly in, in urban areas. Um, but the fact is that these places are much safer than they have been since before the transformation. Um, and they're particularly safer for low-income residents, right? Who feel um, tremendous amount of increased um, uh, free, freedom, uh, freedom from risk anyway. So as one public housing resident says, I thank the good Lord I can finally release him to have some type of socialization because he could not play at Ida B. Wells, which was the former public housing uh, complex. There was too much shootings and everything. And in fact, and as I said, crime loans are, are in fact down. So these are the three, um, these are the three mixed income sites. Um, so significant reductions in, in violent crime. If you look at other index crimes, the patterns are not unsimilar. Uh, crime is down overall, um, and uh, still still higher than the city average in two of the sites, but actually below it. Now. now that masks some volatility, right? So if you look at crime rates uh, by quarter, um, you'll see that in warmer months you have these sort of spikes, right? More people are on the street, more activities going on. There's more uh, more criminal activity as well. And it's these spikes that uh, help shape resident perceptions about crime um, in, in ways that, um, you know, that inform their, how they respond to their neighbors and to their concerns with the neighbor. Uh, still, though, most concerns really focus on a range of incivilities, right? And this um, is about noise, this is about unsupervised use, this is about people, particularly young people, hanging out. Um, uh, but so 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 the responses to these incivilities are certainly about uh, the idea that policing these behaviors are gonna is gonna be effective in ultimately reducing crime. But they're also in response to some basic preferences of the middle class who, who are living in these communities, right? Um, and often they uh, residents and uh, development professionals make a kind of seamless connection between these incivilities and ideas about. Uh, more significant crime. So a homeowner says, for example, the message that property managers are sending, we care, we want you to live in decent housing, but we also want you to care. We don't want people living in housing who are going to mess it up. So that's drug dealing, that's prostitution, okay, clearly <coughs> criminal and problematic behaviors. That's selling cigarettes out of the back of your place. That's loitering, right, at 2 a.m. That's people swinging by in the car with music. That's the whole kind of attitude. So this sort of seamless connection between, uh, between incivilities and crime. Another homeowner says, I feel safe around here, but if someone came to me and wanted to buy my unit, I would sell it because it's not what you, I bought into. But it's the people who hang out on the corner and barbecue, the youth, watching them running from this house and that. Um, so again, these sort of, you know, um, basically concerns about, about behavior rather than uh, safety and threat. And a public housing resident sort of responds, right? They're acting like we're the problem, but our community has been like this. They have a problem when we're standing on the corner. That's what we do. We gather in groups. There doesn't have to be drug activity or anything for us to hang around. So the interpretation of people on the street is, uh, on the part of homeowners and, and property management is largely that this is 
a crime waiting to happen. The sense of uh, public housing residents and lower income folks is this is sociability. So uh, this leads to a set of responses, right? Um, both uh, in terms of uh, uh, regulation and, and various forms of privatization. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, includes sort of the routine uh, limitations on access to the use of public space. And uh, it is particularly focused, these, these regulatory regimes are particularly focused on low income residents, public housing residents and other low income renters. And it should be, I should, should be pointed out that the, the, both neither property management nor uh, more affluent residents in these neighborhoods make any real distinction between public housing residents who have been relocated to these sites and other low income subsidized renters. So, uh, so they become the target of these regulatory regimes. So a development professional at one site says, there's a huge distinction between owners and renters. What the owners do that's annoying to the owners are things that you'd expect in a condo building. You know, they're leaving their trash in the trash room instead of throwing it down the chute. They're leaving their pizza boxes out, right? Whereas the renters, you know, it can happen all the time, a tax credit or a subsidized renter is selling drugs out of the unit. So the presumption is that we're talking about very different kinds of behavior among different kinds of uh, residents. So the nature of regulation plays out both in terms of governing private behavior and in terms of trying to control and redefine public space. So there are a range of lease requirements, house rules, uh, work requirements, household maintenance, drug testing, um, guests, or rules around guests and visitors, uh, inspections that are visited on renters. Now, in theory and, it, and by, by law, Right, what you visit on one renter, you have to visit on another. So, market rate renters, middle class people, are also, uh, you know, if there's if there are drug testing requirements at a site, market rate renters are also um, subject to drug test drug testing. If there are, um, uh, you know, unit inspections on a site, market rate uh, renters are also required. Um, in fact, though, so the expectation is at least once a year you let someone in your apartment to make sure you're treating it right. In fact, this um, rarely occurs among market rate renters. And uh, for public housing renters in particular, these inspections are not annual, but often monthly. Um, and part of that is because of the different uh, streams of funding that go into subsidizing these apartments. You have different organizations that uh, have a stake in these apartments. But the outcome is you've got you know rather draconian and um, uh, and, and uh, frequent visits and um, surveillance. Um, it also plays out in terms of the control and, and definition of public space. So controlled access, uh, community rooms as opposed to a lot of open civic space, uh, fenced in uh, playgrounds. Um, uh, and there's a particular focus on, on and, and not, just the, not just design, which we'll look at, but also regula regulations designing use, right? So uh, regulations against barbecuing. Homeowners can barbecue on their, in their private space. Renters cannot barbecue in public space and they have no private space. Um, uh, a particular focus on loitering. So any, any kind of public presence of people without apparent purpose uh, is loitering and is sanctionable. Uh, so a couple of examples. So. Part of the issue is that um, the ideas behind new urbanism, which which talk about you know sort of the in part about the importance of civic space and uh, mixed use and of walkability, the kinds of features of the built environment that can promote social interaction, um, are sort of selectively uh, um, embraced, and the the aspects of new urbanism that get embraced more thoroughly are ideas about defensible space rather than civic space. So you've got private entrances which are meant to promote the um, ownership and taking responsibility for uh, monitoring and surveillance to keep places safe. You've got, um, to the extent you've got playgrounds and public, public space for, uh, for recreation and social interaction, you can, can't really see it here, but this is you know, clearly fenced um, and controlled. And you've got community rooms that residents can sign out but that management is 
in control of. Um, this is the same site for which you saw the uh, distribution of uh, units by income. And it's the site actually with the most uh, park uh, available to it. But parkland is um, peripheral. Um, actually, these residences that are on the edge of the parks are homeowner units. These are townhomes. Um, and uh, low, the rental units are here and are, uh, so have less easy access to this stuff. Um, this uh, boulevard is an area that often gets used for barbecuing and socializing among renters, but uh, property management and homeowners um, think that's an improper use of this space. That this, is, this should not be considered a park, right? This is a boulevard, it's green space, but we shouldn't have people hanging out. So a development professional, you know, uh, explains, right, they used to, they, public housing residents, are used to being able to stand outside in the hallway or in front of the building and cuss each other out and all that. You can't do that here. That's a violation of your lease and the projects you can do that. So, you know, yelling or uh, hanging out can be a violation of lease. Hanging laundry on your balcony can be a violation of your lease. There's a long list of lease, um, lease violations um, that speak to basic incivilities. And a subsidized rancher says, you know, you can't go out on the front, they don't want you on the front. They don't want you on the back, you can't barbecue. And I never lived anywhere where you can't go out the back of your house to barbecue, you're a prisoner in your own house. So in addition, and to maintain this sort of regulatory regime, is a set of surveillance measures, right? The, mainly through property management, but also through um, more, through engaging the police. Unit inspections I've already talked about. Cameras, um, in one of the sites, about 150 uh, CCTV cameras were placed around and um, uh, targeted at um, all the rental buildings. Uh, not the public parks, which already have City of Chicago CCTV cameras. So the city in general is expanding its um, electronic surveillance uh, of its citizens. Um, and resident recruitment. So property management will go to residents that they know and say, have them keep an eye out on things and let them know if there are things that, um, that are a problem. So uh, property management uh, manager at one of the sites says, you know, according to my visual inspection, I can look at a building and look at it and say, I need to go and visit that person on the second floor, right? Just by seeing um, that there's too much traffic inside the building going on. When I start to notice it, there's a pickup of traffic, I know there's something wrong. And the thing is, I don't so much as go over there, I call residents inside the building that I have a good relationship with and I say, hey, what's going on? So you've got sort of formal surveillance on the part of management, electronic surveillance on, with cameras, and informal surveillance um, through recruited residents. So public housing residents at one side says, it's like everything they do, you do, they know about it. Right? And another at a different site, believe me, you're being watched, the cameras, the cameras. And if anything goes wrong, they pull you in the office, and they're gonna tell you every detail. Now for some residents, this is a, this is a fair trade-off, right? So they move from a uh, housing project where elevators don't work, where heat doesn't work in the winter, um, a very big project, uh, to these safer neighborhoods with much better housing units. Um, but for many, uh, and in fact, I, I would, for most, um, the trade-off is, the, the fairness of that trade-off is not so clear. And these uh, regulations and these um, mechanisms of surveillance have a kind of panopticon effect, right? That they are being constantly uh, watched, they're walking on eggshells, and the consequences for public housing residents are significant because, um, you know, if you lose your right to, uh, to your lease, um, and this is your permanent housing choice, you may lose your right to subsidize housing overall. Uh, so I anticipate myself, right? Penalty, differential impact. So a number of sites have uh, embraced a kind of three strikes and you're out. Um, uh, uh, policies, so again, this increased risk of eviction. There's a zero tolerance policy for criminal activity, um, which includes uh, the criminal activity of relatives and potentially of guests, and includes things like um, uh, you overuse and abuse of alcohol. Right? Um, so uh, a re public housing resident at one site says, if your grown child has committed a crime outside of the area, they're telling you these people can't come and visit you. They're going to immediately evict you from the property because you have a visit from a relative who's committed a crime. I don't agree with 
and it separates families. And a CHA staff member talks about how on the way to a meeting, you notice a couple of um, black guys hanging out on a, on a stoop, on, sitting on the porch of a unit. He knocks on the door, and he says to the, to the um, resident, who's a uh, public housing resident, you know, you can't have young black guys hanging out in front of your house, right? You'll be held responsible if anything happens, and if something goes wrong, you can be, you can be evicted. So there's this extension, right, of responsibility, not only to family members who live elsewhere, um, but and not only necessarily to guests, but to people who are present on space that you're responsible for. So what are some of the responses here? Um, I think you know the basic message here is that rather than sort of effective integration, we're seeing uh, a, a sort of new new forms of stigma and exclusion in the context of spatial incorporation. Right? Public housing resident says, so we're like little testing mice. We just want to see if we're going to make a wrong move. That's why they give us three strikes like, and we're out like some kind of animals. You also see some countervailing dynamics. So in some cases, public housing residents, other low-income residents, in the absence of public space, uh, in the absence of public space, um, are appropriating um, space that is available for social purposes. So you have people bringing up folding chairs in front of their houses. You have people barbecuing on, uh, um, on, on sidewalks or on the kind of boulevard I, I pointed out earlier. You have the appropriation, uh, you know, in, in the words of um, uh, the market rate rent, the invasion of spaces like, like, um, like parking lots for social purposes, right? So a market rate renter says they need a park for people that are loitering on the street. They're in front of your house. They're coming in front with about 10 chairs, kids running up and down the street. Um, you know, uh, so, so in some cases, there is this sort of you know, reappropriation. But in most cases, what you see is withdrawal. Right? So rather than, um, rather than risk uh, ev eviction for minor offenses, uh, public housing right says, I'm just going to stay in this shell in my house and mind my own business. When they come for me, they come for me. All right, so a few uh, quick conclusions, and then I hope we can get to some discussion. Um, so clearly there are some, some successes, right? Uh, safety, better built environment, and so forth. Uh, but these broader integrationist goals, the fundamental argument for why um, uh, both dispersal and mixed income development is, is an appropriate response to concentrated urban poverty, are, are proving to be elusive. You have continued segregation for voucher holders, as we saw earlier. There's been little economic and social integration in mixed income communities. And in these mixed income communities, what you have instead is of, of effective integration is a kind of um, move from segregation in the public housing from which they moved to a kind of incorporated exclusion. Right? They are they are integrated spatially, but they are excluded socially, economically um, from uh, from partic full participation in these communities. So why is that? I mean, part of it is about some fundamental miscalculations, right? Um, miscalculations about the role of spatial <coughs> distance and the likelihood of uh, spatial distance and social distance and the likelihood that propinquity can lead to effective interaction and the development of social capital. Um, the social distance between the poorest and the most affluent uh, in these communities is quite significant. Um, and much more significant in Chicago than many other experiments across the country. And so that um, really militates against the kind of um, idea that spatial proximity would lead to effective uh, interaction. And Second, I think um, the idea that um, the, the, the relative focus on role modeling and the idea that um, we can solve problems of poverty by focusing on the behaviors and orientations of the poor overemphasizes the, um, the individual determinants of poverty um, and underestimates, underestimates the kinds of institutional barriers and structural factors that produce and reproduce poverty. Um, third, you've got an over-reliance on housing right, as, a, as a policy mechanism, um, which doesn't address by itself Right, poverty. It's a, and an over reliance on basically spatial solutions to complex social and economic problems. And so you've ignored a whole set of issues that really lie behind um, the generation and the production.
And then finally, I think there's been an over, uh, overly optimistic um, embrace of the idea that market goals, market means, can um, uh, naturally and without support and intentionality or greater intentionality uh, provide the, the means to social ends. That they, these are not, you know, they're not, there's not a seamless and unproblematic connection right, between the ways in which the market works in these contexts and the social goals of integration and poverty reduction. So I think we need to re rethink that. Um, so in the event, there are a bunch of fundamental tensions that, um, you know, between integration on the one hand, exclusion on the other, between use and exchange value, between the promotion of order and the um, freedom to enjoy neighborhood um, na neighborhoods as, uh, as, as equal citizens, and between appropriation and control. And I think there are some implications here about the design and allocation of public space. So we've seen that much of these, much of these developments have been are essentially residential. There's little public space in terms of um, parkland uh, or other places where people can gather. And uh, um, the development of um, commercial and other kinds of um, you know, mixed use spaces has lagged well behind uh, this emphasis on, on, um, on residence. Um, so I think we need to rethink, a, you know, we need to relook at and um, take more seriously some of the tenets of new urbanism that suggest that, you know, walkability and um, mixed use can provide spaces for interaction and effective um, neighborhood. I think there's a set of issues about governance and about participation that, that essentially the decision making around how these uh, communities would get developed, how they would be managed, what counts as and uh, an incivility, uh, what, is, what should be expected of neighbors, um, has taken place largely uh, you know, influenced by, the, by property management and by the most affluent uh, members of these communities. And there has been little opportunity for participation and deliberation that includes the poor. Third, I think um, part of it is about re-envisioning or re- uh, considering what we think about uh, urban life and what neighborhood life in cities is about. Um, you know, I think a lot of the market rate um, homeowners in particular come to these um, sites, come to these developments um, from, suburb from the suburbs, uh, or in some cases from north side neighborhoods which are low density and very much oriented toward single family homes with private space in the back. Um, and they did not anticipate, nor do they think about urban life as being particularly about um, diversity, um, public interaction, and, uh, um, and activity on the street. And part of that, I think, is a marketing issue that, um, you know, the developers did not, were very, uh, a bit coy about um, establishing these new um, developments as mixed income communities that were replacing public housing and in which we would have public housing and other low income residents. They didn't lie, um, they didn't, but they did underplay it. And so some, public, some, some uh, homeowners moved into these places with, and, and claimed basically that they were, they were um, unaware or, um, you know, or, um, or ill-informed. So I think, you know, Thinking about the city as a place of diversity and encounter, and promoting that, you know, as a way of um, attracting those who want to live in a place of diversity and encounter is um, maybe a, an important um, important thing to consider. And then finally, I think we have to think about the limitations of the local. I talked a little bit about this a moment ago. That you know, housing policy is not poverty policy, and although they were associated social service supports and associated you know, uh, job training and uh, a number of things that were meant to um, sort of bring public housing residents you know, on a more equal footing with their more affluent neighbors. That was a relatively minor uh, consideration in the, in the rolling out of this policy. Um, and that uh, even if you ramp that up, um, it's insufficient. You really need to think about other systems, 
and about the sort of macrostructural and institutional um, determinants of policy. So the fact, for example, that housing policy and public housing um, redevelopment in Chicago and other cities is completely decoupled from um, school reform um, is, is fundamentally so I think I'll stop there and invite comments, questions, uh, and the like. Thank you. So what's the essential driver behind these policies? Is it the ethnicity of the poor people or just poverty as such? Does public housing also exist in the more white states? Yes. Uh, so in Chicago, in most of the cities, the, the sort of older industrial cities of the north and northeast, public housing is um, almost, if not exclusively, uh, has housed um, uh, racial minorities, and especially African Americans. In, um, now, they're not all highly concentrated like this. So in the south, for example, in places like Memphis, it's mostly smaller scale, barrack style public housing, but it's virtually all African Americans. In cities like Seattle, Portland, cities on the uh, San Francisco, on the West Coast, where the racial and you know ethnic composition of the population is quite different, the public housing looks very different. So, in in the Northwest, for example, m public housing residents include um, a lot of Asian uh, immigrants, Vietnamese, um, some Russians, um, Latinos, but and very much more diverse. So you'll rarely see a public housing complex in Seattle or Portland, for example, that is, that is um, monolithic in terms of that. So the, the, um, so the stated aim of the policy, though, is about addressing concentrated urban poverty. And interesting, I mean, you raise a good question because um, in spite of the fact that these populations, certainly in the cities where public housing has been most problematic, like Chicago, these populations are, are African American, but this policy is silent on the issue of race. Now, early reform, so the Gautreaux ruling in Chicago in the 60s, for example, were, was, was fundamentally about racial equity. And it, this was a court case brought against the Chicago Public Housing Authority, um, uh, arguing that public housing by its very nature was uh, racially was discriminating against African Americans and was in uh, contravention of anti-segregation laws. And that led to the um, relocation of many public housing residents, African American residents, into predominantly white suburbs. Um, but since then, um, you know, subsequent policies that meant to, meant to address uh, the failings of public housing have been race neutral and have talked about economic integration, not necessarily race, racial integration. Um, it's, I'd be interested in knowing if, if uh, in the fieldwork that you conducted, if at all there was a, a comparison which could be made as to whether people who live in public housing uh, prefer to live in a very monitored environment, which is a mixed income housing colony, for example, rather than those which are not mixed income. Um, I'm not, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know if there is any such pr preference, because in my mind, it's, it's a complicated issue. For example, living in a mixed income um, community, like the one that you were talking about, has its own benefits, but then uh, the downside is also seems like quite a bit to live under uh, extreme monitoring, extreme regulation. How do you define loitering, for example? Uh, so do they then prefer to just live in communities which may be uh, from the outside segregated racially, but at least then they have the benefit of living with, within their community? So. Um Interestingly, when these, um, when these um, new developments began to uh, accept residents, um, they had no trouble attracting market rate homeowners. Um, 
the units were priced somewhat below market. They're ver now very well located um, because of the ways in which um, the central city has been developed and um, regenerated and because of the extent to which more affluent people now are moving back into the central city. Um, they're on, they're easily accessible. The, the central city is easily acceptable either by car or by public transportation. So these units sold pretty easily until the, until the economic downturn. There was relatively more difficulty getting public housing residents to agree to move into these mixed income communities. Now that's due to a couple of things. One is clearly, we, um, in, in our research, we clearly um, people were concerned about the extent to which they would be accepted in these new neighborhoods and worried about the extent to which there would be um, excessive kinds of monitoring and surveillance, whether it would be, they would be comfortable there. Um, but it's also because, you know, um, they, um, you know, the, the, dis the time between relocation, demolition, and then redevelopment was three, four, five years, right? And so these people were out in temporary housing um, for a number of years, and some of them were settled and, you know, didn't want to move again and, or, um, you, know, was, you know, had reconnected with their social network somewhere else. And so those are also reasons that we um, I don't know, it's kind of a trade-off. So on the, this is, um, I mean, what many residents talk about is, you know, on the one hand, these are safer communities. My kid can go out and play. It's a, that's a wonderful thing. Um, this is a wonderful unit, you know. Uh, um, but on the other hand, there are these significant, and, and, so, and so in terms of like, um, you know, stress and um, mental health, you know, there's significantly reduced stress from the, threat of violence and death, right? But there's increased stress from the threat of, you know, eviction and losing your housing sensitivity. And so, you know, more, it, there is some variation, obviously, but, um, uh, but this is clearly a, an issue that people have thought about and, and trying to work. Yes, uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. I just uh, want to pick up from your last point. In fact, you mentioned about the school, actually. Yeah. education and I would like to get to more uh, to know uh, how this real um, housing policies and uh, integration approach address this question of education because education is one of the I think in modern societies produce inequalities and if you are not having education if it does not ex uh, improve chances of education or health so as you have mentioned it's a kind of an isolated approach to improve and it's not about the power to improve and in fact just social prop kind of a spatial aspect of improving lives of people. A little bit more about that education now. Thank you. Uh, so the public housing, the public housing, the public uh, uh, school, public education in Chicago is problematic as it is in many large cities. Um, there have been a range of different efforts to reform it over the years. Um, from a focus on more local control of schools to um, a focus on um, uh, incentivizing uh, performance and punishing lack of performance. So part of the dynamic that was going on in the context of uh, the transformation was also the closing of a number of poor performance schools, which led to the moving or to churning of school populations to other schools around, around the city. And now the principal focus, uh, I mean, so there are, so um, there's, I guess, two, I'm going to sneeze. Now that I said it, I'm going to sneeze. All right, I'll sneeze in a minute. Um, there, are, uh, there have been two kind of thrusts here. One is the development of, now, the development of a set of magnet schools uh, particularly the higher level, which are competitive, public schools and publicly run, um, that are actually quite, many of them are quite excellent, um, but they tend to be um, accessed by families with greater capacity to, you know, pay attention to where these schools are, to um, help their kids through the um, testing and admiss uh, admissions process and so forth. Um, and the second thrust has been around charter schools. So 
These are um, public schools that are privatized, that essentially are given over to either nonprofit educational organizations or for-profit school um, firms to, to run. And, um, you know, and they, uh, some of them are very successful or, or look very successful, some less so. Um, there's a lot of arguments. So, so proponents argue that charter schools open up, you know, a kind of the opportunity for creativity and reform that is, is crushed in the context of a large public bureaucracy. Um, and opponents or critics suggest that um, a couple of things. One is that, um, yes, some charter schools can do very well, but basically by, by funneling public resources into the development of these few charter schools, you're undermining the, the, um, the potential of fixing the system as a whole. And second, that although the outcomes that charter schools um, often tout as, uh, as evidence of their success are often um, driven a lot by selection biases. So that even that, even when um, charter schools um, ex you know, accept enrollment based on a lottery, that over time they cancel kids out in ways that you know, lead to a much more highly selective group. Students. So these things are all going on sort of at the same time, and in some cases, like in, in Oakwood Shores, one of these sites, there's a. So the University of Chicago for, runs, I think, four charter schools now. How many? Do we have, no, yeah, uh, several charter schools <laughs> on the south side of Chicago, and you know these are these are you know um, I hasten to add effective you know well-running schools, um, but they're you know the, it's a small it's a small uh, drop in a very in a very large. Um, and so is, is addressing the needs of a relatively small set of students. I'm not sure how well that answered the question. Thanks. Uh, to continue the uh, question about education, um, what impact does this kind of housing have on private schools? Have the number of private schools gone up? Uh, are more schools or, or uh, it's a mixed uh, lot in, in the public schools? Um, certainly the number of charter schools has gone up, which is this sort of public-private yeah, thing. I don't know the answer to that question. But my, I, I, would, I feel pretty confident to say that this, this um, housing policy, the transformation, has nothing to do with whatever's happening in terms of the number of private schools. Um, I don't think it has had any impact on that. But I don't know whether um, there are more or fewer private schools now than there were. Actually, the number of private schools have gone up. Okay. Yeah, at least uh, since the 60s in, in Chicago. Uh -huh. But um, and more parents are sending their kids, kids to private schools. To private schools as they can. Right. But uh, I don't know whether it has any connection. Well, the connection that it has here is an, another example of ha of compartmentalized participation. That is, the schools that higher income residents in these communities send their kids to are more likely to be private schools That's what I was than the kid than the schools that low income residents send their kids to. Um, and so they don't so they they don't so there's no really interaction in institutions either um, because they're going to different different schools. Yes. Uh, two questions. Uh, first one is uh, any specific insights on why the housing voucher program had less positive effects. And uh, the second one is, so at least in India, the experimentation with slum housing or low income housing is to give ownership units right. rather than rental. So you might, so basically it's segregation and concentration. Right. You're putting up poor units on a very low amount of premium land, mm -hmm. building vertically, but you're giving ownership. Right. Would the effects of self exclusion or loss of self value what do you think? Would it be higher, lower, if if you have a tenure of security in terms of uh -huh. and being able to sell your own units after some time back into the market and move up that economic chain? Mm -hmm. So, to the first question, um, uh, I think part of the reason that that the voucher strategy has led to largely to a reconcentration of people into relatively poor neighborhoods is 
um, in part a function of uh, management. So in the Moving to Opportunity demonstration project, which was an effort to, to, um, to see whether mobility programs can lead to effective integration and, and better health, economic and educational outcomes, and so forth. Um, you know, when in, in the initial moves, when residents had uh, housing, you know, had, had more um, intent uh, housing counseling to help them find places, and they were required essentially to direct to at least the, the treatment group was required to move to a neighborhood that was less poor. Um, there was some positive effect there, but over over moves, a number of those residents ended up moving back either closer to where their social networks were, you know, they, they no longer had the sort of counseling support and so on. Second um, is partly a function of the market. So, you know, voucher housing relies on landlords that will take vouchers. Um, the, the state is willing to top up the cost of rent, right, from, you know, from fair, mar fair market value to what the resident can afford. And in more affluent neighborhoods, that distance is too great. So between those, the, those two factors, where, ha where voucher housing is available is in neighborhoods that are largely African American and, and still fairly poor. So the second question um, uh, on home ownership. Um, so there was an experiment in the 80s in the US following Thatcher's experiment in the UK to try and provide uh, to try and hand over essentially public housing um, complexes to their residents by offering home ownership opportunities. It, it did not, it didn't pan out. And I'm not actually, I don't recall exactly why or how, um, but uh, it, it, worked, it worked more, it worked more in the UK where, you know, where ownership was, was transferred. It didn't, didn't work in the US. There are in these, in some of these mixed income sites, there are, um, homeownership opportunities for public housing residents. They're a relatively small number, um, but they do exist. Uh, they tend to have been, and they've been relatively successful. That is, um, there have been any foreclosures, for example, and at least in the two sites that have them that we've studied. Um, uh, they tend to have been taken advantage of by public housing residents who are particularly well placed. So. The number of resident leaders, for example, who are members or leaders of the local advisory councils, which was the tenant organized, the sort of tenant representative group in each of the public housing residents who, you know, ended up um, in either employed by or certainly connect well connected to decision makers at the CHA. Those are the people who end up moving into these units. Um, I think I think it's possible, you know, that. If you can make home ownership work, that you can, you can affect some of the, some of the benefits you're talking about. I think that you know, home ownership isn't for everyone, and uh, um, you know, it's always it has been the the sort of um, the the presumed American dream, and you know, if you don't own a home, somehow you're you're less of a citizen. Although the I think 2000, you know, I think the housing downturn and the foreclosure crisis has shaken that up quite a lot, right? And, and I think there are lessons there about, um, you know, about promoting home ownership for people who really can't afford it, right? And so unless you can establish financing mechanisms that are, that are manageable, then moving to home ownership is probably not it. Um, I was really intrigued by the contrast between the difficulty getting uh, public housing residents to move into integrated communities and once they got there, um, what you called, I think, the, the highest common denominator, that the norms that were enforced seemed to not be the norms of those residents that had been so hard to get there in the first place. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, it, it seems like the higher income residents in these communities also had a lot of trouble accustoming themselves to uh, norms that involved low income residents living there. Do you think there are systems or structures that could have been set up to make it easier for that interaction to happen? Or is that just sort of doomed from the start? Is it better to have a housing company, do a management company doing that? Or, I mean, the police doesn't seem like a great alternative, but it's maybe a little less intrusive. 
Um, and then the only other uh, part was, it does seem like even if there are some substantial benefits in terms of earning power and that sort of thing, they're not the kinds of social capital benefits that we want to see. Um, so are there systems or are there other ways that uh, do create the kind of role models and other uh, goals that this is trying to provide? Um, okay, so I'm going to start with the last one, and you're probably going to have to you're probably going to have to repeat the first. Um, I think that um, that you know maybe there may be structures and processes that can promote more equitable arrangements and, and more of a collectively constructed set of assumptions about what neighborhood life should be. And those might include, you know, sort of participatory mechanisms that bring residents together and, you know, let them talk and work these things through. Um, it, um, but those processes are notoriously difficult, right? Because, so I'll give you an example of how they, so there, there are a number of, of uh, mechanisms that were set up that brought residents together to uh, deliberate, right, about various things. But they tended to be quite separate. So um, public housing residents and low-income renters that were, you know, so tax credit renters, brought together in renter meetings um, to which market rate renters did not show up, because why should they? Um, and that were, in the event, much less about deliberating about, hey, how things are going, you know, and more about here are the rules and, you know, you know, people are watching and, you know, walking outside of your apartment and pajamas is, you know, upsetting your higher income neighbors. And so they were not really, in the event, they were not really deliberative bodies in the way they might be. Um, uh, and then, you know, homeowners, condo owners, there are homeowner associations that are, you know, by, by law, they're, that's what that's about, is about the governance of these areas. But they have, um, they have spillover influence, right, that, that speaks not just to the management of a building, but also to the sort of tenor of the neighborhood. And then there are things like uh, CAPS meetings. These are um, Chicago Alternative Policing Strategy meetings. So these are meetings that um, the city of Chicago and the police department organize in each, in each police beat as a way to connect residents to the police, to make the police more understanding and responsive to residents. And these are actually meetings where, some of, one of the few meetings where residents from across the board show up. Public housing residents show up, market rate owners show up, everybody's concerned about safety, everybody wants to live in a safe place, right? But these um, meetings ended up being quite contentious because of the way in which, um, again, not, not necessarily, and even not often crime, although a shooting would, would obviously focus the discussion on violent crime, but often about these incidents. Um, these problems were laid, sort of laid at the feet, uh, either explicitly, often explicitly, sometimes less explicitly, of, of public housing residents who were still there, or their guests and their friends. And so these became what could be right, a public forum where residents from different backgrounds who clearly share the same values and interests um, could work together on them, ended up being quite contentious because of a kind of set of assumptions about who's to I don't think it has to be that way. Uh, I just think that you need that, that those processes require a lot of care and intentionality, and they require, uh, you know, probably some, I'm not sure training is the right word, but training on both sides of the aisle, as it were. That is, you know, um, you know, low income people who have no experience, for example, volunteering on boards of directors or, you know, engaging in that kind of liberation coming into that context are a significant disadvantage, right, if they're trying to deliberate with a bunch of people who, who do, you know, for whom there's a language and a style in the way. And so you need, to, you need to develop that. But you also need to develop on the other side, you know, uh, a sensitivity and a recognition that, you look, you're, for the higher income residents, you're not the only guys in the room, you're not the only guys who live in the same. So, uh, so I think there are ways to do that, but it requires intentionality.